And coming up next in this next segment, we're going to have a series of speakers. There are five speakers. I would like to invite all of them up to sit on the stage. And afterwards, I would like to invite each of them one by one to go to the podium and give their presentation. Each speaker will talk about examples of a successful initiative in gastronomy tourism. So here are the five speakers who will join us on stage. Mr. Antonio Montesinos, Pan American Confederation of Hospitality and Tourism Schools, Mexico. His Excellency, Mr. Ben Waits, Flemish Minister for Mobility, Public Works, the Flemish Run, Tourism and Animal Welfare, Government of Flanders. And Dr. Temestian Asifa, JTB Tourism Research and Consulting Company, Japan. Ms. Munyi Griffith University, Australia. And lastly, Ms. Jutama Wisan Singh, Perfect Link Consulting Group from Thailand. So a round of applause for all five of our presenters. Please. And may I now introduce our first speaker to the podium. Mr. Antonio Montesinos, Doctorate in Tourism Specializing in Gastronomic and Tourism Planning. Dr. Montesino, has carried out gastronomic and tourism research, lectures, workshops, consultancies, certifications, diagnostics, consolidation, innovation, and business creation, attraction and route, integrated in more than 50 academic institutions, 300 tourism establishments, lodging, catering, and hospitality in more than 30 countries. So may I invite to the podium Mr. Antonio Montesinos. Hello, today I will talk to you about an unpublished model of sustainable and touristic destination planning, practical case, Cuba. My presentation will be in Spanish, so you can learn some very useful words like comer, bueno y barato. It means to eat good and cheaper. And especially in, in Mexico and in Thailand, you have to ask something. Está picante? Is that hot or spicy? We must be very careful with these kind of words. Well, eh, el objetivo del modelo es la planificación de la gastronomía y el desarrollo del turismo gastronómico sostenible, coadyuvando y beneficiando de manera prioritaria a las comunidades receptoras. En el año 2010 eh, hicimos un diagnóstico en Cuba. Los principales problemas que se encontraron fueron el embargo o bloqueo de Estados Unidos que inhibe el desarrollo económico, social y por supuesto el turístico, ya que genera falta de diversificación, innovación, digitalización y comercialización de los productos turísticos. Esto trae como consecuencia la pérdida de identidad y transculturación gastronómica por la escasez de ingredientes endémicos y también, por supuesto, por la muy débil cadena de valor alimentaria. Eh, turísticamente, el principal problema fue la baja evaluación que los turistas internacionales daban a la gastronomía cuando salían del país. Si integramos todas estas problemáticas, podemos vislumbrar una terrible situación. Falta de seguridad y soberanía alimentaria. Y lamentablemente, hambre en las comunidades receptoras. Eh, el proyecto está integrado por formación turística, por el Ministerio de Turismo de Cuba, y el Centro Empresarial Gastronómico Hotelero, que es la empresa de investigación y consultoría que desarrolla el proyecto en cinco destinos prioritarios en la isla, de la cual yo soy director, y la Confederación Panamericana de Escuelas de Hotelería, Gastronomía y Turismo, COMPET, que tiene más de 100 miembros afiliados en más de 20 países y que me honro en representar en este importante evento. La segunda estrategia, por supuesto, fue dar capacitación a toda la cadena de valor alimentaria y turística, no solamente a los profesionales del servicio, sino también en las comunidades. 
Eh, este es el modelo. El modelo es consecuencia o tiene la base en mis trabajos de mi tesis doctoral. Se convirtió en un libro Turismo Gastronómico Sostenible. El modelo tiene tres condicionantes. La primera, se tiene que trabajar en gastroturismo, buscar seguridad y soberanía alimentaria. La segunda, para integrar productos gastronómicos y turísticos, se requiere trabajar en patrimonio cultural y gastronómico. Sea este ya reconocido como Patrimonio de la Humanidad por la UNESCO o por la misma comunidad receptora. En este proyecto se trabajaron cinco destinos. En cuatro de ellos hay patrimonios UNESCO. Hay que tomar lo que ya ha sido reconocido porque además es más viable en cuestión de rentabilidad y factibilidad. El, el modelo tiene dos sistemas. El primero es de seguridad alimentaria regional sostenible que es condicionante. Si tú no tienes seguridad alimentaria, no puedes generar productos turísticos. Vas a dañar a las comunidades. Una vez que se logra seguridad alimentaria, entonces está el sistema descriptivo de planificación gastronómica y turística sostenible. Pero para que se logren proyectos integrales, se requiere un clúster gastronómico y turístico que pueda generar buena gobernanza y, sobre todo, políticas públicas prioritarias. El clúster tiene como principal objetivo desarrollo y beneficios a la sociedad receptora e integra toda la cadena de valor alimentaria, desde el campesino, el restaurante, el hotel, la agencia de, viajas, de viajes, la marca, etc. Este modelo se ha implementado en Colombia, República Dominicana, México y otros países. Recientemente fue galardonado eh, por el Premio Excelencias Turísticas en Fitur, en Madrid, por coadyuvar al desarrollo del turismo sostenible por medio de la gastronomía. Eh, la Habana es evidentemente un destino muy importante para nosotros. Ahí se desarrollaron negocios gastronómicos tematizados, se crearon itinerarios como los del museo, museo del chocolate, museo del café, museo del ron. Y de igual manera se oficializaron y profesionalizaron los paladares. ¿Qué son o qué significa paladares? Eran negocios gastronómicos en casas particulares que no eran oficiales. Al ser profesionalizados, han incrementado la competitividad de la oferta gastronómica, no solo de La Habana, sino de todo el país. Y se han vuelto tan famosos que los han visitado personalidades como Barack Obama, entre otros muchos. Es muy importante mencionar que La Habana acaba de ser declarada capital de la coctelería de Iberoamérica por la Real Academia Iberoamericana de Gastronomía. El siguiente destino es el turísticamente el más importante, Varadero. Ahí creamos conceptos gemelos, twins. ¿Por qué? Existe la Casa del Ron y la Casa del Habano, pero están juntos. Venden ahí, obviamente, estos productos tan emblemáticos, pero finalmente se convierten en centros interpretativos que motivan al turista a desplazarse a los destinos donde se elaboran estos productos. Por ejemplo, el mejor ron del mundo, y lo digo yo porque me gusta mucho, está en Santiago de Cuba. No es lo mismo tomarte un ron Santiago, 11 años, en el, la casa del ron, a tomártelo en donde ha sido elaborado. Es una experiencia auténtica e inigualable. Lo mismo sucede con los cigarros o los sabanos. Buscamos que la gente vaya a Pinar del Río, donde se construyen los mejores del mundo. Los siguientes dos productos son, como podemos ver, también tienen nombramiento UNESCO. En la parte de arriba se ha desarrollado la ruta del café. Y en la parte inferior, que es Trinidad, esto es Santiago de Cuba, y en la parte inferior, que es Trinidad, ha generado un fenómeno muy interesante, el, el, la creación de turismo doméstico e internacional. 
se han desarrollado muchas viviendas o renta de viviendas que también beneficia a las familias, pero lo más interesante es que hoy el turista nacional e internacional gasta más dinero en alimentos y bebidas en estos paladares que en la misma habitación y ha generado o ha coadyuvado al desarrollo. Esto es nuestro último producto agroturístico, donde se integra de manera regional el patrimonio de la humanidad Valles de Viñales. Aquí podemos ver el paisaje que es espectacular. Después se lleva al turista a una fábrica para que vea todo el proceso de elaboración de los habanos. Y en la parte inferior podemos ver Las Vegas. The Vegas are the fields where the tobacco ground. And over there you can see the torcedor. Torcedor literally means twister because he twists the tobacco, the tobacco by hand in a very artisanal way. Esta vega se, es, se conoce como la vega de Héctor Luis. En tres años ha crecido más del 300%. Ha incrementado su planta laboral en más de 30 personas cuando anteriormente solo la manejaba la familia. Y además se ha visto beneficiada toda la región donde están porque el gobierno le ha dado prioridad, entonces han construido carreteras, han mejorado los servicios, etc. Los principales resultados que se han tenido del año 2011 al 2018 que lleva el proyecto son entrenamiento a más de 2.500 profesionales de manera directa, beneficiando a más de 15.000 de manera indirecta de toda la cadena de valor alimentaria y turística. Más de 350 establecimientos. Se ha diversificado el producto turístico y lo más importante, se está generando desplazamiento hacia el interior del país que anteriormente solo tenía turismo de sol y playa. También se ha mejorado la evaluación de la gastronomía en las encuestas de satisfacción de los turistas se coadyuva a la seguridad alimentaria y al desarrollo sostenible de las comunidades, pero es importante mencionar que todavía se tienen pendientes muy importantes, sobre todo generar distintivos de calidad, certificaciones de competitividad internacionales que incrementen la competitividad del país y crear una política gastronómica y turística prioritaria con una agenda multi e interdisciplinar. Y por supuesto, la creación de indicadores cuantitativos, pero sobre todo cualitativos, que puedan medir cómo la gastronomía puede ayudar a minimizar la pobreza y realmente puede beneficiar a las comunidades receptoras. En conclusión, no puede existir turismo gastronómico sostenible sin seguridad y soberanía alimentaria. Es muy importante que la Organización Mundial del Turismo tenga una agenda transversal con la FAO, que consideren a toda la cadena de valor alimentaria y turística y que se integren a los valiosos trabajos de la UNESCO y de la ONU. ¿Para qué? Para minimizar el hambre. En nuestra humilde aportación hemos creado este proyecto, Travel, Help, Anit. Estamos trabajando con nuestras universidades de varios países, con grupos de semilleros, de profesores y estudiantes, y también con las comunidades, si éstas elaboran proyectos que coadyuven a su mismo eh, territorio. No tenemos dinero, pero tenemos conocimiento y tenemos experiencia. Finally, I would like to ask you a very, very important favor. Please, not to the US Cuba block and hunger, achieve food security and improve sustainable and smart gastronomic tourism. Really, I really believe we can do it, but just we can do it together. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mr. Antonio Montesinos. You may like to join us on stage and remain on stage if you would like to. Our next speaker is a Flemish nationalist politician from Biersel in the province of Flemish Brabant. Currently, he is the Flemish Minister for Mobility, Public Works, the Vlaamse Rand, Tourism and Animal Welfare. Please welcome His Excellency, Mr. Ben Waits. I'm Ben Waits. I come from Flanders. Flanders is, in fact, a state of Belgium, the largest state of Belgium, with a lot of uh, autonomy, for example, in the field of tourism. There is no uh, Belgian tourist organization. There's only uh, a Flemish-speaking one. Uh, Visit Flanders, for example. And Visit Flanders, we try to attract... Is this okay? We try to attract tourists. That's better. Thank you. We try to at attract tourists. We try to, to focus, to have a strategy that focuses on our main trumps, our main assets, for example, arts and culture, but also, in fact, food and drinks. And why is that? Because we know that more than 40% of tourists abroad choose their destination, their tourist destination, in the, the meaning and the, with the association with local gastronomy. So local gastronomy is important for 40% of the tourists in choosing their tourist destination. And we think we, from Flanders, we have a lot to offer. We think we've got gold in our hands. But we feel a bit neglected. We feel a bit neglected because um, we see that if you look to the Michelin stars, for example, the highest density of Michelin stars per square kilometer, per square uh, or per inhabitant is in Flanders. We're world top. And so we think we've got a lot to offer. But still, when we ask the, the foreign tourists, just name top 10 countries, countries that are top of mind, countries that you associate with good food and drinks, well, Belgium or Flanders is not top of mind. So we've got a problem there. We've got gold in our hands, but we can't get it sold as much as we do or we want to. That's why we, uh, we had a strategy, strategy with three verbs. I would say unite, choose, and promote. Unite, meaning that we gathered all culinary actors around the table in one Flanders food faculty. Flanders food faculty with not just uh, public uh, authorities, but also private actors, private players. For example, we had uh, the, our chefs, our, uh, Pit, Peter Gosses, three uh, star Michelin, three Michelin star chef, but as well representatives of hotel schools, rep representatives of the, the culinary journalists. So we gathered all around the table. Uh, one flag, one team, one message. Two, choose. Because the first job we did was identifying or, or defining a culinary identity. And that's a question of choice. And because everybody says, we've got great foods and drinks. That's what everybody says. But what's, what is so special? about the thing you can offer in Flanders or in Belgium. What's so special that makes a difference if you compare it to all the other countries? Well, we had one, what do you call a slogan, meaning or saying Flemish craftsmanship that is about enjoyment at every table and every counter. That has two meanings. Enjoyment at every table and every counter that means that, yes, we got the highest concentration of Michelin stars. We're world top in that field. But that's not our main trump. That's not the most special thing. We think that in Flanders, there's only a very small gap 
between the culinary elite and all the rest of it. The regular restaurants, even the snack bars. We can offer you quality in all those places, and not just in the elite restaurants. So it's not just about the elite, not about the Michelin stars. It's not about just the flagships. It's about the fleet, the whole package. We can offer you quality in all those restaurants and even snack bars. And two, craftsmanship, as, as I said, Flemish craftsmanship, that's about enjoyment at every table and every counter. And Flemish craftsmanship, that's maybe our main trump, our main asset. Because you know, we're a small country. We don't have that kind of terroir, like for example, France or Italy has. We're a small country, yes, we got Great ingredients, for example, great shrimp. We've got uh, Belgian Andars, uh, chicory. We got hop. But that's about it. And that's not our main trump. Our main trump is the fact of craftsmanship. We import top ingredients from all over the world. And we do better things with it. For example, and it's a bit of a secret, but Flanders or Belgium, it's called the country of the land of chocolate. Uh, well, I can tell you, we don't have one single cacao tree growing in Belgium or in Flanders. And still, we're called the land of chocolate. What a scam. <laughs> in fact, what a scam. Real thing is, we import cacao beans from all over the world, from Ivory Coast, from South of America. And we do better things with it. So, in fact, we're not, we're not the land of chocolate. We're the land of chocolatiers. The people who do great things with it. The craftsmen. That's what we are. And same thing for our beer. We're the country, land of beer. Nah. We import ingredients, yeasts and hop, from abroad. And we do better things with it. We, we make great beers with it. So we're not, in fact, we're not the land of the beer. We're the land of the brewers. We're the land of craftsmen. And that's what, it's, what our story is all about. It, it's a choice. We choose an identity. And that's craftsmanship. That's who we are. Three, we had unite, choose, and three, promote. We want our culinary professionals to communicate this, that same message. We want to, them, everybody to stick to that, that one story. And of course, we promote that message abroad and even at home. Uh, through Visit Flanders, we have a promotional, a promotional narrative from Flanders with food. You'll, uh, you'll get it uh, today. But we also have different kinds of actions. And I can talk a whole day about it. But we got something like Flemish Kitchen Rebels. Flemish Kitchen Rebels. And that's a group of about 50 or 60 chefs under the age of 35 years. We select them. And we promote them throughout the country. And the idea is we want young people under the age of 35 to go to chefs, restaurants of chefs under the age of 35. They can offer top cuisine at a very reasonable price just by our promotion. And they're not only ambassadors at home, they're also ambassadors abroad. Uh, I brought five of them with me, with our airplane, this morning. We just arrived a couple of hours ago. And um, may I introduce to you Niels Proost, Jonas Hagerman, Anthony Snook, Stan Aldenaert, and Bram Helens, and they got a present for you. Of course, they didn't, they didn't come uh, empty hand and ended, so they got a present for you. And of course, what is it? It's chocolate. Chocolate not from our own beans, from the beans of the Ivory Coast, from South of um, America, but made by Flemish craftsmen. And that's our old ideas. And even uh, if you look carefully, we even put a little gold in some of the chocolates. So just uh, try it, enjoy it, 
we take them abroad thanks to the collaboration with uh, TAT, so uh, the Tourism, Tourist Authority of Thailand. They will make a, a tour over here and they try to make some kind of a fusion between Flemish cuisine and Thai cuisine. It will be a great experiment. And just to conclude, just a, lo a last thought I want to share with you because this morning we had the opening speeches and we talked a lot about uh, gastronomy, but it might be a good idea to, uh, to drop the name gastronomy and make it gastronomy. Gastronomy being the art of receiving guests, and that's what it's all about. It's about gastronomy, the art of receiving guests, and we should never forget that it's not only about what you're serving at a plate, but it's also about the smile you're serving it with. And I think that's a great idea in this country of the smiles. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, His Excellency Mr. Ben Waits. I'm sure this room is also full of smiles now with the chocolates giveaway. It's pretty impressive. First time I've seen it. We like it, though. Please give us more. <laughs> So, to the next speaker, Dr. Tamestian Asefa is serving as a consultant at JTB Tourism Research and Consulting Company, a think tank subsidiary of JTB Corporation, one of the leading travel agents in the world. Dr. Asefa has expertise across the travel and tourism industries and topics such as travelers' behavior, market study, travel statistics, and tourism marketing. You may use the podium microphone for your speech. Dr. Asefa, all yours. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, as I have been uh, introduced, my name is Thomas Gen. I'm uh, representing the J JTB Tourism Research and Consulting Company. Again, so you'll be hearing about the cases in Japan still. So there's so many cases about Japan today. Um, it, it might be a little bit uh, confusing for you guys to say, maybe to see uh, uh, why this person is presenting about Japan. <laughs> Uh, the fact that I've been living in Japan for quite long, I'm pretty much uh, linked with the culture, the history, and the language. I'm pretty much uh, really in love with the country, so I'm working with a Japanese company, uh, one of the biggest travel agents. So uh, I would like to share with you uh, how the Japanese gastronomy tourism looks like, what kind of issues and challenges currently existed, and what kind of potential solution we can actually apply in order to solve some of those uh, challenges. So my presentation will be a little bit different from what the previous uh, d d presenters present about Japan. Uh, I will be just uh, presenting uh, based on the quick facts. Oh. Yes. Uh, as you all know, uh, the Japanese food, the Japanese cuisine, which in Japanese literally means washoku, it's actually um, an intangible cultural heritage that is uh, registered under the UNESCO. And this uh, gives really a big potential for the Japanese uh, food, which really attract a lot of um, uh, uh, tourists to the country and give more uh, potential to the tourism industry in general. Uh, as you know, the Japanese food, uh, maybe as you have heard before, it's, it has uh, the characteristics of explaining uh, different uh, features. You can tell what kind of, you can tell what kind of uh, season you are, based just simply by uh, seeing the dishes in front of you. You can tell whether it is a summer season or whether it's a, a winter, just because of the plates that's being decorated by in different forms, as you can see here on the right side. And uh, the fact that Japan is uh, really having a very diversified uh, gastronomy or food ingredient is the food is really fresh and it has a very well-balanced and healthy diet. And as you know, in most of the Japanese, or in Japan is one of the top country in the world is having the longest uh, uh, life expectancy, which is really uh, could be part of the contribution or the effect from uh, this uh, the food or the ingredients which are uh, consumed in the country. Uh, this actually been presented before by uh, Mr. Nakamura as, as well as by Mr. Kubo in, in their presentation as why uh, the foreign tourists is actually being coming. Whenever they plan to come to Japan, uh, what would be their expectation? 
the foreign interest is about Japan. And uh, this is the research that was uh, uh, done by the um, Japan Tourism uh, Agency, and it's about 68% of the travelers are actually expecting to enjoy the Japanese food when they're traveling to Japan. This is really interesting, and you can see to what extent the Japanese food has a potential to attract the foreign tourists. This is really one of the best case studies that I would like to share. Again, it's going to be a bit duplicated by the, uh, as it was presented by the previous presenters. This is the best cases that I could share that recently been released in Japan uh, just two years ago as it was presented. This is the, the essence that the gastronomy tourism by itself may not be strong enough. It would be much better if you can uh, just link it up with other tourism resources. So in Japan, it's not only the food, but also the, uh, the onsen, which we call it the hot spring. Experiencing the hot spring is really one of the best experiences. So this, the onsen and gastronomy tourism association is really uh, one of the best, best, best practices that combine the uh, other tourism resource activities, and at the same time, the gastronomy uh, tourism. So I personally really uh, admire this impressive uh, idea. I would like to just to touch upon into some of the issues that are, uh, uh, which is really important to consider when we talk about Japanese gastronomy. Um, in Japan, well, not only in Japan, but in most of the countries, when we talk about the food, doesn't, mean, doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that the food is just all grown in, in the country we should know that the gastronomy tourism or the food in general is heavily dependent on the imported food items, which is somehow related with the previous presentation as well. As you can see, about 1.7 million tons of the foods, which is in, in the fr uh, fresh and dried fruit, is actually being imported from outside of Japan, which is uh, most of them are from the US and the, the Philippines, and followed by the frozen vegetable, which about half of these uh, food items are being pre uh, imported from, uh, from China. So we can say that the gastronomy tourism is also heavily dependent into the other countries' imported items, which is uh, one, one another kind of supported or interlinked uh, kind of uh, system. I would like to present another issue, which, which was not really presented earlier. This is one of the best, uh, well, interesting, and at the same time, it has some kind of challenges uh, uh, system in Japan. Have you ever heard of all-you-can-eat system in Japan, in the restaurant? It's very much popular in Japan. If you walk all those uh, the very metropolitan cities, you will find such kind of advertising posters in all the restaurants. This is all-you-can-eat. It's, it's, it's a very interesting for foreigners because it's uh, frictionless. You don't have to talk with the waitress and with, you don't have to communicate in just the, uh, the language that you cannot uh, uh, speak. So simply you just uh, uh, go to the restaurant and then have a plan of 120 minutes or 90 minutes just for some amount of money and then you can eat everything uh, within that uh, uh, time period. So th but the reason why I raise this issue is because I would like to link with the, um, the topic of uh, a food waste. In most of the cases in Japan, the food waste is basically coming from the businesses, which is the restaurant, and at the same time from the households. So this is one of, I could say, not the main, but it's one of the causes for the food waste in Japan, which I currently just presented as one of the issues here to consider. So link it into the next topic, which is uh, the food waste issue, which is not only particular to Japan, it is a global issue. Whenever we talk about the sustainable development goals, we still need to consider about on how uh, we should uh, reduce the food waste. And as I have said earlier, this most of the food waste in Japan, uh, actually more than half, is coming from these businesses, mainly the restaurants. They, they dispose a lot of uh, foods they thrown away uh, just simply because of uh, uh, the, the, the consumed debt is already expired or some reasons or because of excessive supplier during the party time. This is one of the critical issues to consider. And the, the other case is from the households, which is this is basically coming during some uh, events, let's say for the, during the... Um, the New Year event or the Christmas time uh, in Japan, uh, there's a lot of uh, food being thrown away. So in general, that means uh, more than about 6.4 uh, 
a million tons of food is being just uh, thrown away uh, in Japan. This is the serious issue that I need to, uh, I would like to raise. Just this is not only particular to Japan, but as a global uh, issue, we need to consider about the uh, the issue of the food waste. But however, even if this is the one of the problem, but we still have some solutions in order to solve it or in order to reduce this problem. One of the cases which I would like to share is um, the very interesting initiative that was uh, established in 2011 by uh, the Nagano Prefecture. Uh, in Japanese, we read it uh, Sammaru Ichimaru, which means 30 minute and 10 minute initiative. Just simply means during the party time when you have some uh, gatherings, the first 30 minutes after you're tossed, just eat the food. The business talk, the networking will come later. Just first eat the food for 30 minutes. And then after 30 minutes, just go walk around and make the business networking, all the business talk. And then later, just 10 minutes before end of the party, come back to your seat and finish all the remaining food. This is one of the initiatives now started uh, in the Nagano prefecture. And I believe this is really interesting. And now most neighboring uh, municipalities are actually also started this, uh, applying this kind of uh, initiative. I would like to just another issue as well. This is uh, uh, the, uh, the issue of the, the motainai, which uh, have you, how many of you know the word motainai? Interesting, I mean, except the Japanese. <laughs> The reason why I ask is this has uh, become a, uh, one of the, uh, the international slogan uh, thanks to Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Wagari. She brought this slogan into the United Nations uh, for the sake of not specifically to the food, protect, uh, food uh, waste reduction, but for the environmental protection issues. So the reason why I presented this is her slogan, her ideology, her ideology can also be implemented into the, uh, uh, to the food waste solutions. The word motainai in Japanese means literally can be translated as what a waste. This is a kind of a shameful feeling when you throw something that it has still a, an intrinsic value. So this kind of motainai feeling is really in all the minds of the Japanese society. And if we use this slogan into the food waste uh, reduction uh, issues, we can be successfully manage uh, these um, issues. Then uh, finally, I would like to just sum up so some of the uh, concluding uh, pointers. Uh, as I have said, Japan has a very strong potential in gastronomy or in the food, so it's important to, to leverage on this uh, potential. The second point which I would like to raise is about the uh, public-private partnership, which uh, the case what I've mentioned earlier about the Onsen and Gastronomy Tourism Association, similar, that kind of association or similar activities or initiatives can be, uh, uh, can be uh, established more. And my company, which is JTB Group, can also be involved as one of the main players in the sector. And finally, which the issue which I uh, raised earlier about combating the food laws is really important, which uh, we need to give the, uh, uh, an emphasis. And again, our company can also be uh, literally, uh, I mean, our company also can, can be in joining this initiative as well. And the 3010 initiative, which I presented earlier, the 30 minute, 10 minute initiative, it can be very easily implemented. So I really recommend to you, uh, I don't know, maybe tonight in the dinner, we can apply. Seriously, because in Japan, most of the restaurants, they say they could solve the food waste problem after this kind of initiative. They heavily reduce the food waste. So let's just have a try in your room or just in some gatherings, and we can see the change. I thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dr. Asefa. Let us go on to our next speaker. Moon Yi Lai is a PhD candidate at Gifrith University, Australia. Her research interests include destination branding, destination food image, and Chinese consumer behavior. Moon Yi's current research interest is on Chinese tourist expectations of food and food experiences when traveling, with a passionate focus on how to attract Chinese tourists through their stomach. Ms. Moon Yi Lai. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. What you just saw here, is not what you think. It's just an issue of the podium is too tall. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Man Yi. I'm a PhD student from Griffith University, Australia, specializing in food tourism. 
Together with my research team, Catherine and Ying, we are going to talk to you about what we have learned in researching the fascination food image of Australia among the potential Chinese tourists from China, which is currently the largest tourism market in Australia. Oh, sorry. So before I continue, I would like to ask you a question. What do you think Chinese tourists eat when they travel? local food or Chinese food. So if you think local food, please raise your hand. All right. If you think Chinese food, raise your hand, please. Wow. OK, we have 92% of <laughs> more people who think that Chinese would prefer Chinese food. Okay, now, we have different opinions in the room. There are some still believe that it's local. It is, this is not a surprise, because this is one of the hot topics that the industry stakeholders are struggling with. And uh, there are two schools of thought. Some believe that Chinese, most Chinese tourists would expect Chinese food to be served throughout the trip. But the other things that Chinese would like to sample local food. In a 2014 market survey, Tourism Australia has discovered a problem of perception, and Chinese people who had not visited Australia has ranked Australia way below other countries. But look how perception changes. Once the visit, Australia overtakes France and Italy. I'm sorry, France and Italy. And regarded as top destination for food. So there is a significant opportunity for Australia to increase its food appeal to the known visitor. Our research is to help Tourism Australia understand the current perception, and we investigated the Chinese pre-visit knowledge, their feelings and attitudes towards Australia as a food destination, and also to determine how this food, food uh, perception uh, in affect their intention. So we surveyed 520 potential Chinese tourists to an online survey. They tended to be younger and middle-aged traveler. We also get to know that when they are looking for information relating to food and travel, they rely heavily on the recommendations of their friends, the local, and the social media. This implies that if you like to engage with them, the social media would be the key platform, particularly Weibo, WeChat, and also that Ma Feng Guo. So this is the cheapest and the most effective with of mouth marketing. Okay. And what Australian food is? This is the first question they ask, we ask our respondents to describe in their own opinion. So what do we found? The most popular Australian food, that's the range of seafood, king crab, abalone, and for the meat, we have beef, kangaroo meat, and crocodile meat. Would you like to take a guess which is the most recognized Australian food? Any guess? They're surprised. <laughs> yes? A kangaroo? Yeah. There you go. So you can taste the kangaroo jerky. In fact, yes, kangaroo is the most recognized. So this is the difference between the big player, chocolates, and the students. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I bought for you, for sampling. Yeah. OK, now, now the thing is that kangaroo meat is the key. Now, Brisbane, when we talked to the Brisbane um, Marketing Division in Tourism Australia, it was a surprise to them because kangaroo meat is not widely served in the restaurant. This meat could, may lead to disappointment for the Chinese tourists. If you notice, all the images here is about Australian fresh local produce instead of a dish. So what important message that's sending here is that Australian food are well regarded the particular food brands. However, lacking of a dish, a signature dish. So we then asked the respondent to evaluate what are the most attractive food attributes of Australia. And we found that food environments and the high quality fresh uh, produce are the most 
interesting and attractive dimension. And Australia is also well known for its dining with spectacular view, as well as its exotic food, as you just seen. Yeah. And um, on the other hand, the contrast, fine dining restaurant and premium food and wine is, is regarded and perceived as expensive and less appealing. So there are also many people are not aware that rule. Eh? It was black here, sorry. So not many people is aware that the street food is available in Australia. And most critically, the attributes related to local cuisine were generally given a very low rating and regarded as less well-known. So we then try to understand what motivates our target audience. We ask them to rate a range of activity based on their liking. And what we found is that we determined that Chinese is actually driven by authentic food experience. Sorry, those um, who think that Chinese would like Chinese food. Look at what we got from the respondents. So most importantly, they are very keen to participate in the local lifestyle dining and eating local food. They're also excited about street food, festival, as well as food tour experiences. However, the majority indicated that Chinese and Asian cuisine, fine dining and cooking classes are the less attractive and exciting activity for them. So what is clear is that we need to stop pushing Chinese food onto these younger travelers, younger Chinese travelers, and instead offer chances to experience local cuisine. And about 70% of the respondents have high interest to visit Australia for its food. So through a modeling technique, we further confirm that there's three particular dimensions, which is food culture, environments, and dining places have a very strong influence on Chinese intention to visit. This indicates that if, um, this indicate that you can strengthen these three dimensions in your promotional strategy to increase your destination appeal to the Chinese tourists. Coming out from this, we have two key points to make. First, this case study demonstrates um, a practical example for destination marketers to measure the destination food image and also to assess the effective, um, effectiveness of the destination food branding and determine whether there is a need to align our strategy with the expectation of the tourists. As you can see from these images, Tourism Australia tend to position Australia as a luxurious food destination. And our respondents have not reacted to the strategy used. What Chinese tourists really want is the experience that allowed them to eat like the local, which is not necessarily expensive. Second, we learned that there are differences in the meanings of authenticity between the tourists and the marketer. We invite you to rethink that definitions of authenticity in the destination, whether it should be a dish or cuisine that represents traditional cuisine, modern cuisine, multicultural cuisine, or authenticity that defined by the tourist. And we will talk about that kangaroo uh, representing the authenticity of Australia could be contentious. It is a native ingredient, however, it does not reflect in the day-to-day -day life in the modern Australian culture. So the key is every destination needs a signature food experiences, but that make tourists hungry. And ask yourself, what makes you hungry if you think about Thai food? I'm not sure about you, but I'm very hungry now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Man Yi. And now our next speaker, Dr. Jutama holds her PhD in Tourism Marketing and Management from Lincoln University, New Zealand. She is now Managing Director and Consultant, leading an innovative team at Perfect Link Consulting Group, a consortium of experts specializing in community-based approach and capacity-building program, organization development, sustainable tourism development, and community participation in sustainable development. Dr. Jutama Turnkap. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I'm sure they're keeping me as the last speaker today for a very good reason. You are here in Thailand, and if you have not heard anything about Thailand cases and initiative, you shouldn't be here in Thailand at all. The dialogue hasn't started until we realized what we are really talking about. In fact, this morning, my husband asked me, because I told him I'm going to speak at, about you know, gastronomy and tourism, and he asked me, what is the difference between gastronomy and culinary and food? What is the difference? Because the dialogue hasn't started until we know what we are really talking about here at the forum. Gastronomy is about the relationship between food and mankind and people. Culinary is about cuisine and food. So if we are going to talk about gastronomy, so let me give you a sense of urgency because if we're going to have dialogue about gastronomy, we have to start thinking about the relationship between people and our food, not just only talking about food. We are actually having this initiative, if I'm going to, okay. So let me give you an, an issue and challenges. That's why we're having this forum and why we have to have this dialogue. The world and mankind are facing the key challenge of climate change. And that's going to affect our food security. If we're not going to tackle these issues from this angle, we're not going to mitigate any of these problems at all. So I'm quickly show you this because whole day, if you are going to pack every ideas, every initiative that we discussed here, I'm going to pack it in 10 minutes for you. We're going to face a problem with the agricultural system because of the climate change. The yield of the produce that's going to happen, the whole world is going to be less. What's going to happen when food is going to face with the scarcity? We don't going to have enough. The affordability, the price of the food is going to go up. So, that is not an issue that one can tackle. So together in this room, we need to face this. So I'm going to show you some of the initiatives that Thailand is doing, not just only tackle in one piece, but what we are doing is trying to tackle it end-to-end -end solution. And I'm thanking to Thailand Research Fund that giving us the opportunity, Tourism Authority of Thailand, Ministry of Tourism and Sport, designated areas of sustainable tourism administration. Together, we form this kind of research. Let me re look at the necessities. When we think about it, we're going to have four very important fundamental necessities, and it's changed the way we look at food. Definitely, water is going to be a big issue. Once we face with water issues, that means our agricultural system is going to face difficulties as well. And that means food. We need to think about energy consumption. Altogether, these four necessities are interrelated. You cannot look at one thing without the other. So health, ladies and gentlemen, we have to look at the whole system, the whole issues, and look at the health issues as well. We talk a lot today about sustainable development goals and how can gastronomy, tourism help achieve 17 sustainable tourism development goals? And that's the big question. But you can start answering that contributing in whatever you can. And what Thailand is trying to do is, not just only starting last year, but we have been doing this for a long time. And in Thailand, we always have a say, 
Nai Na Mi Ka, when I have a lot of my colleagues from Thailand here, you know the meaning, because in Thailand, the plentiful resources, we always said, Nai Na Mi Pla Min, we always have fish in the river. Nai Na Mi Ka, we always have rice in the paddock field. We never have to worry about anything. My Pen Rai attitude, because everything is going to be just in front of the house, just around the garden. It's no longer like that, ladies and gentlemen. And Thailand is also facing this big issue with you. So what we are doing, if you remember, we want to be the kitchen of the world. If you still remember that many years ago, we still want to be that, and we can be that. We introduced Thai Select. Internationally, if you want to go to any Thai restaurants, they look for this logo, Thai Select because we select and we think it's best for the whole nation, for the whole world. And you also heard that recently we also, Tourism Authority of Thailand also launched Amazing Thai Test. Again, we showing, you know, showcase our cuisine and the latest that we look at Michelin Guide Bangkok and there's gonna be many more to come. And with Thai rice for life, that's another initiative that Thailand is doing. I mapped this out because we think we have done a lot. But ladies and gentlemen, are we only tip on the top of the iceberg? There are many more issues that we have to do it and do it together. If today we're going to talk about food experiences, we're going to talk about great restaurants, we're going to talk about technology, we're going to talk about things that people can enjoy. Are we really talking about everything that we need to talk about? We talk about gastronomy, but don't forget our young generation, even us, have very low food literacy. We know very little about our food. Maybe we can enjoy it, but the literacy, we know very little of what we are having or where it's actually coming from. We know very little. Our biodiversities are facing a very challenging situation. We don't know if our seafood on the table is safe anymore. So what we are doing is, this is the research that we are trying to tackle a lot of those big issues in the way that we can. The holistic food for good is simply, think about something that we can do in tourism. So what we are doing here is just thinking about what happened before you even come to the destination. What are you or what could you do when you are at the destination? And it doesn't end there. You can also enjoy the memories when you go back. And again, the holistic, the list here is going to help at least mitigate some of the issues that we are talking about maybe it could also enhance or achieve some of the 17 sustainable development goals. And we heard a lot. Let me show you some of the examples, because very often we know what to do, but we don't know where to start, how to do it. Our project is starting with very small cases. I'm sure our colleagues here from Thailand, maybe you don't know what that is in the little, then that's from Chiang Mai, Gang Ho. So what we're doing is we do food innovation, but we not just only innovate food, just because we wanted to make fusion food or we want to make it more than food, but more on going and explore the ingredients, what the locals really have with their food, what the relation of the food with the local way of life. So Gang Ho becomes something that we have sent the young chef to go and explore about the heritage, the history of the place, and they innovate food. Food, when you talk about food, it needs to be narrative. You need a story. So what we try to do is, not just only food, but we can pair food. And in this case, we experimented pairing food with Thai performing arts. You said, what has got to do between food and performing arts, when chef work with young performing arts students, they can then 
starting to explore local heritage, chef could then present food through the dish to the menu, to the cuisine, to the culinary arts. Performing arts students can also interpret life and then tell us stories. They can pair. So what we, what we are trying to do here is trying to open up the creativities and said, let's talk about food, which is more than just food on the table, because it can also be arts, it can also be different ways of life. We talk a lot about gas flow diplomacy, and I think this is the way that we look at gas flow diplomacy. Everyone in this room can be gas flow diplomat. It's not just only chef. As long as we know our food, know our heritage, and I put Thai word here as well because we like to call it the Thai terminology is here to translate that gastro diplomacy into something that Thai people can also understand. So the importance of narrative storytelling, working with young artisan chef, so then they can be our ambassador. This is one of the uh, chef that we work with, an artisan that really can translate the way of life into his food, because it's not just only food, but it's his, the identities of the locals that he translated. We go further, and people will ask, what else can we do when we talk about food and gastronomy? So we thought, let's try something. So we get together young entrepreneurs, local communities, young chefs, what do they do? We organize an activation boot camp where food can inspire different social enterprises and ventures. So what we did, we have come up with a lot of new ventures. This is some of the example when food and fashion can come together. Now we have a collection of fashions that also be gastro diplomacy of the stories of local. Some of the example, all of these are inspired by food. Even the accessories that inspire by the colors of food and the color of ingredients. So what we did, and I think it could be expanded, not just only in Thailand and many other destinations as well, just to activate that inspiration from food. I've been told that I have one minute left, so these are some of the examples that I can share, but whatever you do, I like to leave you with the food for thoughts before your gala dinner. I know very, when you come to a forum like this, you always ask, what can I do? What should be the take-home message for everyone? So I give you the menu of change. If you don't do anything at all, and you still want to be part of this, just ask yourself four things. And this is very much at the individual level. How many can I have, can I see the hands? How many of you still cook at home? Wow. Seriously. That's good. Okay, so let's tick the first box. The second thing that you should do is talk about food. Do you talk about food? Okay. The third th thing that you should do is you have to know where the food is coming from. Yeah? Oh, I, the hands are disappearing a little bit here. So three things already. And the, the fourth thing is making sure in the cycle there, the local ingredients, you source local ingredients. You don't need to have salmon from, you know, far away. If you are in Australia, have kangaroo. If you are in Belgium, have the chocolate. You don't need to import anything. So you be aware of the ingredients that you have. So four things, because that little actions that you take is going to have a, an impact on many other issues. So start with yourself. Do that four things, because it's going to help other bigger circle that you're going to be part of the solution, not being part of the problems. So I'm sure you will enjoy your gala dinner. And all of this concept has been translated and have been agreed among ASEAN countries, the whole 10 countries that already announced this morning that we already have the declaration that some of these issues are going to be addressed together with ASEAN 10 
member states as well. So thank you very much. I hope I will have more time to talk to you, but this is food for thoughts and take home message. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chutamat. And once again, a big round of applause for all five of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.